Hey guys, welcome back to Intelligent Faith 315. My name is Pastor Jay. It's good to have you with us. Today we're going to be concluding the moral argument for God's existence. Uh, we've been talking for some time now uh, about different arguments for God's existence from natural theology. Uh, our series is Good Arguments for God's Existence. We've covered two cosmological arguments, uh, the Leibnizian cosmological argument from contingency, and then also the Kalam cosmological argument put forth by Al-Ghazali and St. Bonaventure, uh, recently popularized by Dr. William Lane Craig. And today, hopefully, we'll be finishing up with a moral argument uh, as our third installment for this series. So up until this point, uh, we've come to the second premise of the moral argument for God's existence. The moral argument is also called the axiological argument for God's existence. Uh, the first premise says that um, without God, objective moral values don't exist. The second premise says, but objective moral values do exist. And the third premise, therefore, or actually the conclusion, therefore, God exists. So we did cover um, that first premise in our last two or three videos on the moral argument, that without God, objective moral values and duties don't exist. We try to cover the different grounds that people give for trying to ground moral values or give a sufficient uh, foundation for moral, moral values, whether it's sociological, biological, uh, or even uh, different types of consensus or different levels of agreement, whether it's the individual, the group, the consensus of a society, or even world consensus. And we talked about in our last video how those types of consensus, they don't add anything quantitatively different uh, to the answer, just, or I'm sorry, they don't add anything qualitatively different, just quantitatively different to the answer. But we don't need something that's quantitatively uh, superior or higher. We need something that's qualitatively uh, different and higher to give us a sufficient ground for moral values. Any of the uh, previous options or choices that we examined don't give us anything qualitatively superior, just quantitatively superior. And it wouldn't be sufficient uh, to have objective moral values. So if God doesn't exist then it would seem that objective moral values and duties wouldn't exist either because everything else that we would look to isn't a sufficient ground for that. Um, uh, we had some, some atheist, uh, secularist, humanist feedback, and I really do appreciate that. I appreciate you guys tuning in to the YouTube channel and hopefully to IntelligentFaith315.com as well. And I appreciate you guys giving us your feedback. Uh, but there, there's no ethical gene that's found. Um, ethics and morality aren't something chemical or physical. It's immaterial. Uh, plus, there is nothing like that that's been discovered anyway. And it, and it couldn't be discovered because it's beyond the realm of science. Morality is an area of truth that's not itself material. And so no material explanation uh, could be found, so to say, to, to fully define it or ground it. Uh, but since all of those uh, options that we went through are insufficient, it would appear that the only thing that really could um, be sufficient to ground moral values for all of humanity, for all of time, all across the earth, down through the, the, the pages of history, would be a being like God. So premise number one seems to be more, more reasonable, more plausible than its opposite. That without God, objective moral values and duties, they don't exist. Um, we are not saying, by the way, and please please remember this, we're not talking here about moral behavior. We're not saying that if you don't believe in God, you can't behave as a good, moral, decent person. Okay, We've covered this, and, and I really want to make sure there's no misunderstanding here. Uh, we have said numerous times that a lot of atheists and a lot of uh, people who don't believe in the Christian God or any God at all, they're very moral people, and they live very moral li excuse me, very moral lives. So we're not talking about moral behavior here. We're simply talking about um, not moral moral uh, epistemology, believing in morality. We're talking about moral ontology, uh, the actual existence and being of morality. So that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about um, you can't behave like a moral good person if you don't believe in God. We're simply talking about um, for moral values and duties to exist in and of themselves it does appear that the only sufficient ground for that would be God. So, if God doesn't exist, objective moral values and duties don't exist either. Premise number one. Let's move now to premise number two. But objective moral values and duties do exist. So all we have to provide to prove the truth of this premise would be just one moral value, one objectively 
morally right thing that's universally accepted, uh, we don't have to provide a system of things, a system or a list of objective moral values and duties, but really just one, one objective uh, moral value that would be accepted universally. In other words, it would be true for all people at all times and in all places. So could we do that? To prove premise two, could we um, conceptualize or come up with one moral value that everybody would agree is always right for all people at all times and all places? Well, I think that we can. There is at least one moral value that exists. Um, it could be something like this. It's always wrong to torture little children for fun and eat them. It's always wrong. It's always wrong to torture little babies and children for fun and eat them. So I believe that um, really everybody would agree with that. If you don't agree with that, if you're watching this video and you would perhaps say to yourself, well, I think that uh, that might be uncomfortable, but it's not really wrong, um, though you might feel obligated to say that because you may hold to a certain philosophical system that would maybe make you say say such a thing like that. I don't really believe that you believe that uh, in the depths of your mind or even in the depths of your heart. If it was your child, if it was your sister's child or someone in your family, someone that's close to you, would you always hold to that opinion? I think that that's definitely uh, an acceptable moral value, an objective moral value that is universal for all people at all times and all places. That it's always wrong to torture little children for fun and then eat them. Uh, but then again, of course, you have to ask yourself the question, how, how could that be? How is it that something like that could be objectively, universally, always wrong to humanity, regardless of our religion, regardless of where we live on the planet, regardless of our culture, how could such a thing be? And this is precisely uh, the mysterious truth about moral values is that there are objective moral values and duties that do exist. So we don't have to provide a, a huge long list of them for premise two to be plausible, uh, more plausible than its opposite, more plausible than its negation. We simply have to provide one. And I think that one fits the bill. And again, if, if you are forced due to your worldview to deny the plausibility of uh, of that objective moral value, that it's always wrong to torture little children for fun, please email me at jason at claycup.com, jason at symbol claycup.com, or you can email us at uh, intelligentfaith315, the email uh, that's there on the website, because I'd love to talk to you. Something would be wrong with you. We would consider you deficient, uh, morally speaking, as a human being, if you didn't agree with that. Um, now, there are some people, of course, that hold to moral relativism and moral nihilism. Let's address those real quickly. We talked about those in some prior videos. Moral relativism would basically say that um, all truth claims can be equally equally valid, equally true. So whether it's uh, a truth claim about morality or some other type of a truth claim, moral relativism, or just relativism in general, says that competing or opposite truth claims can, can all be true at the same time. So what's true for you is true for you. It's not true for me. Uh, so in the area of morality, moral relativism could be something like this. Well, um, moral choices uh, are really just preferences. So just like you have a preference in terms of ice cream, some people like strawberry or uh, vanilla or chocolate, well, moral choices are the same way. Um, you like to be nice to children, this person likes to be mean to children, and this person likes to eat little children. And so those are all equally valid, equally true. Um, none of them is superior. And again, I would just say that if we really lived in a world where everybody believed that, if that type of a belief system was taken to its utter conclusion, the world would be unlivable uh, because the only thing that we would have to enforce a type of morality on the world would be might, would be force. Uh, like the Greek philosopher Thrasymachus said, might makes right. And unfortunately, that would be the only game in town. But again... I don't really think that you would believe that because all of these people who would claim to endorse moral relativism, there would be something somewhere in their life or in this world that they would say, no, that is wrong. That is wrong. Even in the Secular Humanist Manifesto, um, there's a couple of versions out of it now, even they um, don't believe that certain types of sexual practices are condonable. In other words, uh, they talk about consenting adults um, 
that in order for some sexual practice to be uh, acceptable, according to the Humanist Manifesto, there needs to be uh, consent between you know two adults. Well, just that right there. See, what they're telling you in the same Humanist Manifesto that there are no moral values and duties, however, uh, they are just sneaking in through the back door. However, you need to make sure that there's consent between two adults for sexual relationships, and so they just betrayed the fact that actually they do really believe uh, that there is such a thing as moral absolutes. And again, you know, the problem with relativism, whether it's moral relativism or any other form or shape that it would take, is essentially it's saying that there is no absolute truth. And of course, the one question that you ask is, are you absolutely sure about that? What they're, what they're essentially saying is that I'm absolutely sure that there's no absolutes, whether morally or intellectually or anything like that, or epistemologically. So when somebody says that, I'm absolutely sure that there are no absolutes, of course, this is what we call a self-defeating, self-contradictory, or a self-stultifying statement. So relativism, really, in any of its forms, is really just self-defeating. Um, even beyond that, I think that we discover, if you investigate it on an individual basis, that people don't really hold to moral relativism in every area of their life, which means that it can't be true for them and it can't be true as a philosophy. So it's logically self-defeating and it's unlivable. So it's uh, illogical and it's unlivable, unfortunately. So that's moral relativism over here. But then in the other camp, we have what's called moral nihilism. And this is what very few atheists hold to, but some do hold to it. Atheists like Friedrich Nietzsche, the father of German atheism, and Jean-Paul Sartre, Albert Camus, people like this. And moral nihilism is the destruction and the basically the belief in the non-existence of any morality whatsoever. So if you're a moral relativist, um, you don't think that morality is universal and absolute, but you do believe in morality. And again, many, many atheists are extremely, extremely good, decent, uh, kind, loving, gentle people, great citizens, and I really appreciate that, of course. But you see, a moral nihilist, uh, they don't believe that morality is relative, they don't believe in any morality at all. And so these people over here, unfortunately I have to say that I agree with them to a certain degree because they have taken um, atheism and humanism logically to its uttermost conclusion and these people are consistent. So this is an unpleasant thing to think about and I'm glad the majority of the world does not think like this, but unfortunately this is a consistent, you know, kind of a logical outflow of uh, the atheistic, humanistic, uh, naturalistic worldview that there really is no morality then because if there is no God there's nothing to ground morality and Friedrich Nietzsche was very aware of this and he said to his compatriots in Germany he says you know we have killed God um, so to say with their philosophy that God is dead he began the God is dead movement and he says but before before we threw him over the bridge, so to say, we, we murdered God and then threw his body off the bridge into the water. But before we did that, we picked his pockets and we retained, Nietzsche was basically saying, we retained from our belief in God certain beliefs like moral values, ethical values, uh, purpose, meaning in life, things like this. He says we have no right to do this. He says so we have to be prepared for the path we've chosen, Nietzsche would say. We have to be prepared to jettison belief in any and all moral values and duties, and this is called moral nihilism. Friedrich Nietzsche, he predicted the 20th century would be the age where man would come of age, come of full maturity, and that it would be the bloodiest century ever. And interestingly enough, Friedrich Nietzsche was right. The 20th century has been the bloodiest age ever, and interestingly enough, it's atheistic state governments that have been... Um, the biggest perpetrators of this. So as somebody once said, there is a uh, mountains of bodies and rivers of blood that have been produced by empires or regimes like uh, communism, the communist Russia under Stalin and Lenin, or under Mao Zedong in China, uh, Pol Pot, Ceausescu, people like this. This atheistic idea where moral nihilism is a part of it, where there is no ultimate there is no moral values and duties, and where might makes right, as Thrasymachus said, it's very dangerous. So, like I said, intellectually though, you know, epistemologically, these guys are right, because this is the logical outflow of atheism. Now, I don't like that. I don't really think it's a, 
good way for society to think, but in terms of consistency and in terms of being uh, just consistent with that naturalistic, atheistic philosophy, moral nihilism is what should follow um, when belief in God is absent. And so I appreciate atheists who are moral relativists. I appreciate atheists who do believe in some form of morality. The only problem with that is they're being inconsistent with their worldview. Moral nihilism, they are being consistent with their worldview. They have taken this courageous kind of an intellectual step, Nietzsche, Jean-Paul Sartre, Albert Camus, uh, people like this, and they say that, you know what, we have finally come to the understanding that if there is no God, there can be no moral values and duties whatsoever. And so they try to face up to the, the cold, hard truth of a world in which there is no moral values and duties, and really anything goes, and nobody can really say anything about that. And so this is why Nietzsche, in his writings, uh, The Antichrist, um, Zarathustra, other writings of Friedrich Nietzsche, he was basically exhorting for the superman, the überman, the, the overman, to rise up and to, just by the, the power of will, to dominate the world and to discard the soft feminine values of Christianity, and this is what he would say, and then to assert a strong, dominant, you know, male forceful values upon society. Um, and again, he predicted that this would result in the bloodiest century ever, and he was right. So ultimately, Friedrich Nietzsche predicted that the death of God would result in the death of morality, the death of truth, and this would result in the death of man. I would encourage you to go to Dr. Phil Fernandez's website, the Institute of Biblical Defense. He's got some really great articles on this. Um, it's a very, very scary thing, moral nihilism. But again... Um, if you read the writings of these different atheists, you can see the despair and the unlivability of such a worldview. And that is one of the tests that we can put forth to examine a worldview, whether it's pantheism, atheism, or theism, or any of the seven major worldviews. One of the tests that we can put a worldview through is to see if it's not just logical, but if it's livable. And this type of moral nihilism is unlivable. Uh, and and the, the writings of these atheists betray this actual fact. Uh, we can go through this sometime in the future, but there's a lot of interesting quotes from Nietzsche, Jean-Paul Sartre, Albert Camus, and some of these gentlemen that uh, they address the unlivable uh, outlook upon life if you embrace atheism and moral nihilism. Albert Camus said that the major philosophical question that an atheist must grapple with when they wake up in the morning is, why not suicide? And Friedrich Nietzsche... Uh, wrote many interesting quotes uh, relating to the fact of how hard and how unbearable his atheism became in the later stages of his life. And believe it or not, and uh, I'm, I'm sure you won't believe this if you're an atheist, but Jean-Paul Sartre actually upon his deathbed, and there's documentation for this, and I'll show you the quotes in the future, he actually recanted his belief in atheism, and he did believe um, either secretly all through his life or at least at the end of his life that there really was a, a cosmic creator. So moral nihilism is not going to work for us. And again, though it is logically consistent, it's, it's unlivable. And I don't think that any of these men truly in their heart of hearts really believe that. There would be at least one thing wrong somewhere, such as it's always wrong to torture little babies for fun and eat them. They would agree with that, especially with their own children, of course. So if that be true, and I believe it is, uh, then premise two would be more plausible than its negation. So premise number one... Um, if God doesn't exist, objective moral values and duties don't exist, seems to be more plausible than not. Premise number two, but objective morals and values, objective moral values and duties do exist. And then, of course, it follows logically and inescapably. This is an airtight argument. Point number three, the conclusion, therefore, God exists. If there is no God, objective moral values and duties don't exist. But objective moral values and duties do exist. Therefore, God exists. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the moral argument. There's different formulations of it. Uh, C.S. Lewis and Mere Christianity. C.S. Lewis was uh, a very serious atheist, and he came to a belief in God and in, in Christian theism in Jesus Christ because of the moral argument. He began to realize that um, he was very upset with Christians and believers in God because of the evil and injustice in the world. But then, of course, it dawned on C.S. Lewis, and you can read this in Mere Christianity, that concepts like injustice and evil and you know moral values have no place logically consistently in a world where there is no God. There is no standard of right or wrong. Um, 
and therefore there couldn't be such a thing as evil, injustice, wrong, stuff like this. And so that led C.S. Lewis to the realization that he really did believe in a moral standard, uh, and that was found in God himself. He really believed in a moral law, and therefore he came to the conclusion there must be a moral law giver. If objective values and duties do exist, only God is sufficient to be their ground and their explanation. So therefore God exists. So the moral law, if it's real, even in only one point, the moral law leads to the existence of an actual moral law giver. And I think that if you search your mind, uh, you look inside your quote-unquote heart, so to say, and just ask yourself some deep questions and be honest with yourself, um, there is at least one thing that you find wrong uh, with people's behavior that is morally reprehensible, repugnant, disgusting. Um, even many of the charges that atheists bring against Christians, and I agree with them about the, the you know, atrocities of the Crusades, the Salem witch trials, um, you can't have it both ways. If there is no objective morality, then atheists can't say anything is wrong with anything. Um, but I agree with them. Those things were wrong and are wrong and should be wrong and always will be wrong. Why? Because objective moral values and duties do exist. But they can't exist without God, so therefore, God exists. So, and then finally, one, one final thing I guess to add would, would be this, is that sometimes people ask what makes something wrong. Um, this is typically referred to as the euthyphro, the euthyphro dilemma. That's taken from one of Plato's books, one of Plato's dialogues, with that same title, Euthyphro. Euthyphro was a man who came to Plato in his dialogue. You can get Plato's books for free on Amazon.com or uh, many places on the internet. Really encourage you to read them. I'm reading through some of them myself. <coughs> and uh, the basic dilemma that is put forth to believers in God and immorality, the question is this. Is something wrong because God says it's wrong? Or because some, you know, goodness is something outside of God. In other words, does God de is it is it actually good or bad because um, God just declares it to be good or bad, or because goodness is something outside of God that He recognizes? Well, we would say as Christians, neither. Um, something is good, morally good. It has moral value, um, which then becomes our moral duty, not because. God says it's good, and not because it's outside of God. Of course, the two problems with this is that if if it's good only because God says it's good, then it's arbitrary. Then God could say rape was good, and it would be good. Or uh, torturing little children for fun and eating them is good. And if things were good just because God said them, if that was the basis of morality, God's words, God's commands uh, alone, then... That would be insufficient. Anything could arbitrarily be taken as good. That won't work for us. That's, that doesn't make sense. And then if it was, if the good was separate from God, kind of floating around on its own, it was something that God just sees and says, well, that's good, and then communicated that to us, well, that would be even worse. I don't even know how that would really work. That would have to be something like Plato's theory of the forms, where goodness would just be by itself. I don't know how that would even work, but uh, even that in and of itself, uh, that, that wouldn't be consistent either. And that would, again, be something outside of God. But what we believe in, just so you understand, if you're an atheist or a humanist, even if you're a Christian, uh, we don't believe that things are morally good or morally you know, wrong or bad just because God says that. It's deeper than that. Something has moral value because it is related to the very nature and the character of God himself. When it's according to God's nature, it is good and right. When it's opposed to God's nature, it is wrong, it is evil. And so uh, it's interesting because that is what ultimately we believe in as the foundation for our morality. So moral values and duties have their foundation in the very character and nature of God himself. And this is why we say the moral law necessitates a moral law giver. And the moral law giver in himself, in his nature and his character, Morality flows from the very nature and the being of God. Uh, and you get that not just from Christian theology, good, sound, orthodox Christian theology, but also from philosophy. It would have to be that way philosophically. So the usurpo dilemma, where you're only given two options, that something is good because God says it's good, or because the good exists outside and apart from God, is a false dilemma. A false dilemma presents only two choices, but the third choice, that's usually not mentioned, 
is the nature and the character of God himself? And that is the correct answer. Morality is based and founded in God himself. So it looks like the moral argument actually holds up. The premise one and two are more plausible than the negation. Leads to the conclusion, it's logically airtight, that therefore God exists. That is the axiological or the moral argument. Look to mere Christianity from C.S. Lewis to hear a different reformulation of that. Uh, you can look at reasonablefaith.org. Dr. William Lane Craig has a great formulation of it as well. Dr. Phil Fernandez at the Institute of Biblical Defense. Um, you can buy the um, Blackwell Companion to Natural Theology. It's got multiple versions of the moral argument in there as well. And just keep in mind that our case for God's existence doesn't depend on one argument uh by itself or, or solely one argument, but rather it's a multi-layered argument. So it's multiple cosmological arguments, the moral argument. In the future, we'll get into the design argument on two different levels, the conceptualist argument, the ontological argument. And so all of these taken together is an extremely persuasive and powerful case that it is more plausible than not to believe that God exists. If we add to this the historical facts concerning the New Testament manuscripts, uh, the historical nature of the man called Jesus of Nazareth, uh, the case of Christianity really becomes overwhelming. And the Christian worldview has the answers uh, to questions that other worldviews don't have the answer to. So uh, you really got to analyze your worldview if you're watching this video. Ask yourself, does my worldview, my philosophy, my outlook on life answer life's deepest questions? Origin, meaning, morality, destiny, truth, the origin of first life, the origin of the universe from nothing, things like this. And if your worldview uh, doesn't hold up to this, this test, these questions, uh, your, your worldview would then be bankrupt, and it wouldn't be a good worldview. If you want to be consistent, you should look for another one. Look for a worldview that has the biggest explanatory power and explanatory scope. And uh, we believe that the Christian worldview is that correct worldview just because that uh, it really does logically have the greatest strength uh, so we'll continue to talk about this in the future we're next going to move on i believe to the conceptualist argument for god's